Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Uh, thank you for coming for a talk from Alex Babich and Adrian Logan. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Alex Babich, and this is my partner, Adrian Logan, my business partner. And uh, today we're going to be giving you a brief introduction into hydroponic systems uh, in commercial facilities. So before we start, we'll tell you a little bit about ourselves. Uh, our company is called Neurovine. Uh, we're based uh, out of New York City. We're a startup, been around for about a year and a half. And uh, we're coming out with our first product. It's a uh, automated nutrient dosing and data collection machine and has a uh, web application. Uh, but don't worry, we're not here to like, sell you anything, just kind of tell you a little bit about ourselves. Um, so one of our last things we went into in, uh, in terms of like our startup was like a little accelerator called the i from the National Science Foundation. Uh, it's where they give engineers and scientists money to go travel around the United States and do customer discovery. And so for us, we, we went out and visited uh, cannabis farms all over the country uh, in Washington, Oregon, California, uh, of course, um, in Nevada as well. And uh, so some of these really, some of these, inf in, uh, these interviews were super insightful for us. So we wanted to share with you a little bit about what we learned and uh, teach you a bit about hydroponics. So to get started about hydroponics, we're going to first start by talking about soil, which most people are familiar with. So first of all, soil provides a medium for the roots to grow into, so the plant can stay upright, of course. Um, then we also, the soil also provides a lot of different nutrients the plant needs: the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Uh, calcium, magnesium, many other things that helps the plant actually grow to its uh, full size. And finally, soil provides a medium where, uh, where water can, can be held so that the plants can drink, especially if there's no rain, because the plants always need a supply of water. So let's contrast that with what hydroponics is. It's really not so different. Uh, so first of all, you need some sort of a medium. So there's many different types of mediums. So if you look here on the left, this is uh, something called rock wool, which is uh, it's kind of like cotton candy that's made out of rock. And on the right, we have uh, cocoa core. So it's made out of coconut husks. And both of these mediums are pretty good for holding water. So if you're not, if you're not watering all the time, then the plants will be able to survive for a couple of hours. Uh, over here, these are some different types of mediums. These are, um, in the bottom corner, is um, grow stones, which are a little bit like rocks, except uh, a little bit lighter weight. And then we also have uh, clay pebbles on the top. So these mediums, they provide structure for the plant, but they don't actually uh, hold very much water. So you're going to need to give these plants a constant supply of water. So just looking at this in a, a very, very, very basic hydroponic system, you see this is something like clay pebbles. And they're, they're held in a, it's what's called a net cup. So it's like you can imagine a net, it has holes in it, so that the roots can eventually get out of the cup and get into the water so that they can drink. And then the, the final aspect of hydroponics is the, the nutrients, right? So because you have these inert substances, you have water, the plants really need nutrients in order to grow. Uh, so to get nutrients, you just got to go to some hydroponics store and you'll see all these funky looking bottles. Um, there's sometimes they come in single uh, varieties. Sometimes you have to have like multiple different solutions to feed the plants. Um, also, during different stages of growth, the plants need different nutrients. Uh, so for for cannabis, like you have the vegetative stage, which is where the plant is growing to its full size, growing all of its leaves, uh, and then you have the flowering stage, where the plant is actually growing all of its buds. So you can imagine during these different stages of growth, you're going to have different nutritional needs, uh, which is why you'll need uh, different nutrients. So. Why would anyone use hydroponics over soil? Uh, it seems a little bit complicated, but one of the main factors is that you can actually increase your yields by about 25% if you're doing it correctly. Um, another factor is that you can grow the plants about 30% faster. Again, this is if you're doing things properly, of course. So why, would, um, so why is it like this? Well, if you see like on the, on the right side, you have the, the plant in, in soil, and you see the roots are, are trying to find a place to, to grow into. So that takes a lot of energy for the, for the roots to grow into. So if, uh, if it didn't have to use that energy, it could use the energy to, to grow up instead. So if you see on the left, you see this mass of roots because it's just roots that are growing in water. So for them to grow, they don't have to expend so much energy. And so just kind of a rule of thumb is like the larger the roots you have, the larger the plant. So if you allow your roots to get very large, you're going to have a, a much larger plant. 
Um, another thing is that when you're feeding uh, plants in soil, uh, you're actually going to be feeding these microorganisms in the soil, which will in turn feed uh, the roots of the plants. So with hydroponics, you're using these um, sometimes inorganic uh, nutrient salts, which uh, go directly to the roots of the plants. So you're skipping one stage of the process, which again uh, allows things to move a little bit more quickly. Um, and then finally, for, you know, for us and a lot of guys uh, that are doing hydroponics, it's, it's really good because you have so much control over everything. Um, you can always, you can change the nutrient levels on the fly, you can change the pH on the fly, and so when you have a lot of experience, um, it can really help you dial in your environment and, and really get the most out of your plants. So of course there's still some reasons to use dirt. Um, of course, if you look at, at the photo on the left, we just have a plant sitting in dirt and that's pretty basic. You know, you just plant the seeds and the dirt and, and let it grow. Of course you need some light. Uh, and then, of course, on the, uh, on the right side, you have this very complicated hydroponic system. So already you have comp complexity just, just to get it set up. And in this case, this system needs a pump in order to work, and the, the water is constantly running through it. So if you have um, the pump fails or anything like that, there's a, there's a good chance that, that, your, that your crops can die. So you're definitely going to have some complexity there. And then another pretty big factor is um, that soil typically gives a better uh, flavor for, for the cannabis plants um, because there's just a full spectrum of nutrients in the, in the soil. Of course, there's, there's a lot of things in there that, that we know what they are, um, different types of fungal um, organisms, uh, lots of nutrients. Uh, there's also a lot of things that we don't know what's in the soil. So when we're trying to create uh, hydroponics nutrients, we're only putting certain different uh, nutrient salts in there. So there's going to be some things that are missing. However, you know, people are figuring out how to make them as close uh, to soil as possible. Uh, and also, it's not necessarily hydroponics. Uh, you can, for hydroponics, you can use organic nutrients, um, which are made of organic materials, but that also adds some challenges because they can be a little bit messier and can cause more uh, clogging in, in the different systems. All right, so next we're going to start off uh, kind of explaining a few commercial systems that we've seen um, in facilities that we've Visited. Sorry. And there. Oh. Technical difficulty. All right. Can you just do this? Yeah. All right. um, so this is a drain to waste uh, dripper system. This is one of the most common systems that we've uh, seen in visiting commercial facilities. It's a, a relatively low complexity system. Um, and we're also uh, able to uh, grow a lot of uh, smaller plants rather than uh, growing kind of a, a, a smaller number of large plants. And so if we look kind of at the system here, uh, it's characterized by you'll have some sort of reservoir uh, or a source of water that will be distributed to uh, drippers that are connected to the top of rock wool cubes or depending, you could also use uh, different mediums. And the drippers will be put on timers and they will uh, give off a nutrient solution uh, over the set interval and then any excess water will run through the rock wool cube and then run down a leach tray into a uh, drainage system or drainage uh, reservoir. Here's an example of a farm we visited in California, uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, this is room one of nine. Uh, they do them in kind of different batches. And then they have a central uh, nutrient mixing and reservoir system in a different room. And they'll be pumping those nutrients into the different rooms. Uh, here you can see that they have uh, a large number of plants on, looks like, five trays. And these trays actually, they, uh, they're rolling trays so that you can have uh, one aisleway and then you don't have to waste uh, many hundreds more square feet uh, in a commercial facility. Uh, and this is a very important factor because um, it, it, it really helps reduce the, the cost of maintaining the uh, environments. Uh, and here you can also see on the top of each of these rock wool cubes, there's kind of a, a green uh, little kind of plastic attachment. And that allows the, the drippers to, uh, that distributes the water from the drippers across the rock wool cube more evenly. And then uh, from these leach trays, they'll go down into a central uh, collection system um, 
and here we actually have another facility. Uh, this facility is a little bit different. Uh, they're actually a vertical uh, cannabis farm, and they're in uh, Colorado. And so what's really cool about these systems is they can go between 6 and I think 12 to 13 uh, levels. And the lights are actually in between uh, so that they get side lighting and the plants kind of grow towards the side. Again, we see that we have movable racks uh, to save the uh, square footage on the, in the facility and also to help kind of space the lights uh, between the plants. Uh, there are drippers that go into each of these blue buckets and then at the bottom of each bucket, again, they're being drained to a central uh, uh, you know, waste. And actually, this facility goes directly into the municipal sewer. Although a lot of facilities, um, uh, water consumption for these drain to waste systems may be a little bit higher, especially if you don't have your timing and everything set correctly. Uh, so water usage can become uh, an issue, uh, especially if uh, states like California may be uh, or is implementing new regulations where you can't dump these nutrient solutions into uh, the municipal sewers and then you have to pay for transportation and off-site treatment. You're already wasting nutrients and water that you probably had to pay for. So um, there's, there's a bit of waste uh, in this type of system, um, especially if you're not using uh, a, a a control system that's uh, properly dialed in. Uh, another thing that's uh, a potential uh, hazard to watch out for in kind of systems like this, uh, this facility uses a centralized inline uh, nutrient mixing system. So basically what this means, as they're pumping the water uh, through the, the line, they're adding the nutrients uh, directly into that and it gets directly pumped right to the plants. Uh, usually that's nice, you don't have the central reservoir, although if somebody makes a mistake, uh, you can see uh, millions of dollars worth of product uh, killed in the matter of uh, hours um, due to this problem. And there, there's not too much you can do about it, uh, though these are in a medium uh, that uh, usually can hold some amount of water, uh, so you have a little bit of a buffering um, if you have a pump system that goes down or something like that. Uh, next, we have a recirculating deep water culture uh, system. These are a slightly higher complexity, uh, harder to use. Uh, they're also uh, somewhat more significantly expensive to set up. But it, what you're really able to do with systems like these is grow a smaller number of really, really big trees, like really big cannabis plants. Um, there, there's the farms that we visited, they grow up to like maybe eight, nine feet tall, these trees. I mean, they're just beautiful, it's crazy. Um, and so really how we're able to do this is each uh, plant is sitting in uh, a bucket and you'll have a, a net pot that just has like those clay pebbles or those uh, uh, kind of grow stones that just give uh, a good amount of support to, to the plant. And then the roots just grow right into this bucket, which has a lot, like a large reservoir, like a large amount of water that's being recirculated, um, kind of through the system. So each uh, bucket is connected in series, and then there's also a controller bucket that uh, is generally uh, attached, so that you can take measurements uh, on the system and also centrally um, add uh, nutrients and correct for the pH in the water. And since this is uh, being rapidly recirculated through the system, uh, you can have a generally uniform uh, nutrient profile across um, the system. And uh, so let's move here. So this is a facility we visited in uh, Rhode Island. They're a medical facility. And right here at the, in the center, you can see the main control bucket. And that's attached to 24 plants. Um, and then also right to the left of that, you can see a water chiller. Uh, it's important to keep the, the water temperature yeah, sometimes like around t 5, 10, 10 degrees uh, cooler uh, than the uh, ambient air temperature. Um, and so here these trees aren't at full maturity, but you can uh, see that they're a, a bit larger than the, the previous plants before. But you're, you're also definitely uh, limited 
uh, when it comes to kind of setup because these buckets they have to be a, very sturdy uh, and the, the the plumbing is a little bit harder to set up than just these kind of little lines going to the tops of more or less normal buckets. Uh, these systems also cleanliness is extremely uh, important. Uh, so that's why this facility you can see is very uh, whitewashed and it has very uh, clean floors and stuff like that. So this it generally uh, farms that we visited that are dirtier have a lot of problems and then uh, farms that are kind of cleaner and they have uh, higher uh, standards. They're able to keep pests and other uh, diseases um, away from the plants and yeah. Next we have a nutrient film technique system. Uh, this is generally actually not used for cannabis. We, we haven't seen it. Um, but it's still kind of important, I think, to show you that there, there, just kind of, there are a million different ways that you can uh, set up a hydroponic system with these basic uh, kind of core principles. Again, here we have uh, a more or less central reservoir. Uh, also in here we have uh, an air stone. So for, for these uh, recirculating systems, uh, they use less water, but we also have to make sure that we're um, maintaining the uh, kind of the, the nutrient pH and uh, oxygen levels in the water. So the air stones uh, will be bubbling uh, generally regular air, or sometimes people will just use uh, regulators and pump uh, straight oxygen into the system. Uh, this is actually to kind of feed some of the microbial life that you will see in a hydroponic system. Um, so for nutrient film technique system, uh, you'll again have a water pump that will pump uh, to the top of a uh, channel. And then this is at a slight incline, so that, uh, or decline, so that the, the water will sort of run in a thin film down this channel. And then the smaller plants will have their roots. Uh, they're in kind of neck cups, again, with the, the clay pebbles or something like that. And then the roots will kind of get some of this nutrient film as it runs down um, and then ultimately it drains back into the central reservoir. Um, yeah, so let's look at this facility. This facility is Gotham Greens. They're in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, they're actually on top of a uh, Whole Foods and kind of the, the nifty thing that they do here is they'll actually um, pick the produce, package it, bring it into Whole Foods and then people will buy it and it says it was picked at 115 today, uh, really fresh. Uh, it, it tastes a lot better to have it uh, locally. So, and we're just seeing now that uh, hydroponics, the the cost of technology, the uh, efficiency that people are able to achieve, uh, this is becoming cost competitive with the large commercial farming, um, especially on the the leafy greens kind of and those like uh, spices, those basil's and. Uh, stuff like that. It looks like this is growing a lot of basil uh, right here in this photo. Um, and so here you can see that we have hundreds of these gutters that are just lined up and then uh, towards the the middle here on the right side you can see the um, the nutrient lines and those will run delivering water and they run down to the center here. All of these channels are angled and then they'll kind of recirculate again. Uh, there. These systems are kind of hard to clean. Again, cleanliness is important, so um, it, 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 it causes a problem to have so many kind of channels that are hard to clean and stuff like that. And um, especially with these recirculating systems, uh, you run the risk, uh, if you have a pathogen that gets into a system, you're again feeding and recirculating to all of the plants. So you do run the risk of killing basically all of the plants per system, um, which is why they'll generally limit kind of the, the fate, like the fates that they tie together on the plants. So they'll limit it to maybe um, 2,000 square feet of uh, these channels will be one reservoir and then they'll kind of like multiply that as they have a, a different scale. So uh, other roof, rooftop greenhouses, they had like kind of, they were about 10,000 square feet and they had about six different systems. Uh, going. All right. Uh, next up, we have uh, uh, aeroponics, uh, which is a uh, another system, generally again used for uh, smaller leafy greens. Uh, what's uh, really great about aeroponics is it's one of the most water efficient systems um, in general, and they're uh, able to grow plants uh, quite quickly. 
Um, so in the system here, you'll generally have uh, a, a water in the bottom and a pump that'll pump up to these small misting nozzles that will mist the, the roots of the plants. Uh, again, we're getting a, a very nice mixture of air, nutrients, and water uh, to the root system, which is highly, highly important. Uh, but what you will see, aeroponics is definitely used uh, pretty commonly in cannabis, just not for growing the plants. It's used for starting clones. And so what clones are, um, are they are clippings from tip, uh, what are generally referred to as uh, mother plants, or sometimes they'll clip it off of other plants in production. And it'll be uh, one kind of fan leaf with a few inches of stem. They'll put it into these green collars, and then uh, they'll have this aeroponic system. So on the right side, you can see these green uh, nozzles. Those are their aeroponic misting nozzles, and they're blowing... Uh, they're spraying the nutrient solution, and sometimes they'll also add uh, root-starting hormones uh, to this to encourage root development uh, on the plants. And you can see pretty uh, exciting root development very quickly on, on plants that you would otherwise think, you know, it's just like, I just clipped this off of a plant, and all of a sudden, like, you're able to kind of clone it very easily, which is kind of a, an exciting idea. Uh, and this is really important for uh, commercial facilities because consistency is extremely important. Uh, so this allows them to have an entire crop of genetically identical plants. Uh, they'll all grow to more or less the same height and, and stuff like that. Um, you know, you, you'll often see, like, if you were just cracking seeds and growing fresh, like, you, you'll have one plant kind of short, not, not very attractive, like, not a lot of flower on it. And then you'll have other plants just, they're, for some reason, they're twice as high. They have you know, better spacing of the flowers and stuff like that. So this is one of the kind of important things on the, the genetics and kind of continuing um, the, the, the generations of these plants as you um, grow hundreds or thousands of them. And so that's it for the, the uh, hydroponic systems that we're going over. There are a million different ways to actually set up a hydroponic system based on kind of the core principles of a nutrient solution being somehow distributed to the plants, kind of making sure that we're emulating some of the, condi the conditions and the things that are provided by soil. Um, and then uh, there are also a lot of other environmental factors that uh, we didn't necessarily go over, such as lighting, which is generally interchangeable um, between kind of the different ways that you do it. And uh, you know, we thank you all for coming here and for the opportunity to uh, come and speak to you guys. And we'd love to answer any questions you, you have. Any questions? Yeah. How about aquaponics? Does it work well or not? Uh, yeah. So uh, aquaponics. So like aquaponics. Uh, that's a method of hydroponics where you have uh, fish as a part of the the system, um, and you you feed the fish in this system, and then ultimately uh, it's the the excrement from the fish, and you have to make sure that you have a, a part of the system that can with bacteria and other uh, microbial life to process this and uh, make the nutrients bioavailable to the plants. Uh, that it, we don't really see it too often in cannabis. Uh, it, there, it's a little bit harder to maintain because um, you, you kind of have to take care of the, the fish and then the plants. And um, so uh, often on a commercial setting, like the, the variability that you might see um, in, in the plants, especially for cannabis, is tougher. Uh, you, we'll see it definitely a lot more on kind of the leafy greens because their uh, requirements for nutrients are a little bit uh, less stringent. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. I imagine that like, uh, large companies like Coca-Cola or Starbucks, they're very interested in optimizing um, how much yield they get for their inputs. And I was wondering, like, as they kind of arrive at that, those optimal parameters, is that mostly a manual process, or do they have like interesting ways to measure and optimize these things? Uh, sure. Uh, so yeah, as you're uh, trying to optimize uh, the environment, uh, there's like a lot of different things that you have to take into account. So you're going to be taking into account the, uh, the the temperature, humidity, CO2 levels, light levels. Uh, that's like 
all the things in the air, you also need to make sure you keeping track of like the water, like the, the nutrient levels, pH, uh, the te water temperature. So basically you want to be collecting a lot of information. Also you want to have like cameras taking pictures of things if you really want to get to that advanced level so that you can have all this data coming to you and then you can really see like what's going on. So like that's kind of like the next step at, in farming and like that's farming of the future is collecting tons of data and then making like small optimizations to the environment so you can see growth and like comparing things like in a, in a scientific way. Um, so yeah, I think, yes. does that answer your question or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. Yes? It, it definitely runs the gamut. Um, newer farms, uh, the the one in Colorado that we showed you, that was a pretty newly built farm. They were relatively, like they were relatively highly automated, although a lot of the, the system could really um, stand to for a lot of improvement. Right now, a lot of the technology used in cannabis is more of a, uh, is kind of ported over from traditional greenhouse agriculture, which is sort of stuck in the 80s. Um, so, or maybe the 90s, rather. But you know, it, we we definitely see that there there's a lot of room right now uh, where technology uh, can assist in growing uh, cannabis, in particular, uh, since it is such a high value crop. And there are a lot of things that we still don't know about the plants, so um, since it's been generally unstudied or understudied. Uh, so I think as we move forward, uh, getting more data, getting more insight. Uh, keeping track of more things. We saw the, the, the farms that had better data recording practices. I mean, they're, most of the time they're using clipboards still, um, even in kind of the relatively advanced farms. So it, there's a lot of room for improvement, but the data is a driving factor. So where, um, yeah. does the grower fit into this? Most, yeah, mostly it's, there's a, there's a lot of work that the growers are doing. It's mostly not computers. Um, the growers have to do lots of things. They have to uh, cut the clones. They have to move the plants around. They need to feed the plants, yeah, know, take measures. Yes. I know what to do, but what happens with the system? Is the system going to take the data and then put it into the system? Sure. Sure. So I'll, I'll I'll tell you a story about like one of our customers. Um, so we're very new. We don't we have one customer that we that was like our, our early adopter, and he said and he was spending about three hours a day maintaining his hydroponic system. So that was measuring the nutrients, measuring the pH, making adjustments, uh, trying to make sure that the plants were were optimized. Uh, so when he incorporated our automation systems, which automatically feed the plants and uh, take care of the nutrients and pH levels. He said that he now, instead of spending three hours a day, spends about 25 minutes every 20 days on the same activity. And so for him, uh, as, a, as a researcher, he's now spending more of that time doing, uh, reading research papers and figuring out better ways to optimize his plant. So what we feel like we're doing for, for this example, and hopefully for many others, is um, giving them an opportunity to increase the value of their operation by doing more uh, higher value activities. You're welcome. Yeah. Yes. Um, so uh, in these farms, you're not really allowed to like sample it, you know, because you have they actually have to go uh, be sold through a dispensary or something like that. Uh, however, we're allowed to like maybe hang out with the farmers afterwards and maybe sample some of their products. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, and I'm not even sure if all the farmers that we like sampled was their products or was was a product that they had. Um, yeah, I'm not I'm not like a a huge connoisseur, so it's hard for me to tell. But from from what I could tell, like their the products were pretty good. Um, when we went to um, one of the farms in Oregon, like the guy, he gave us like some some joints, and they were really cool. Like we uh, after we got out of the farm, we went because in Oregon it was this place at Hood River, Oregon, so it's like gorgeous scenery and everything. So we went to this like river really close by and like smoked some uh, one of the joints, and then we started thinking of all these like really crazy ideas of how we're gonna like help him. Uh, so uh, so it's like he helped us to like help him. 
Yeah, we wrote them down. <laughs> we all got to write them down. Yeah, so for the most part, uh, we, we saw kind of the, the traditional halides and, and stuff like that. Uh, they're less expensive. Um, and the, the capital expenditure for setting up farms is relatively high. Um, we, a number of the farmers that we visited, including the one in Oregon, they're typically experimenting uh, with LEDs. They're looking into it. Uh, one farm, they had one room that was using LEDs and another two rooms that were using the HIDs and stuff like that. Um, LEDs are coming. It, it's definitely uh, going to be one a, a very important factor. States such as Massachusetts actually have laws uh, limiting how much electricity you can use per square foot, uh, essentially making it that LEDs are really the only real option. So um, yeah, LEDs, they're, they're great. There, there's some things we don't fully know yet about maybe the, the light spectrums, um, although there are a plethora of companies that are uh, working on it and selling the best lights in the industry. Um, so, uh, you know, we're, we're excited to see it move more toward, towards the LEDs, uh, maybe once they're a little bit less expensive to, to install. But is there like a like a standard like after like I think grow a few batches like you clean out the system or like how often like what is like the maintainability of these things and uh, I'm sure it varies depending on what uh, technique you're using. Mm -hmm. but, like is that kind of like a standard practice or does it vary between different growers? Yeah, I mean I, I'm sure like each grower kind of has their own way of doing it, but a lot of times you're when you're uh, taking the plants like out of the system. So like sometimes it could be like two weeks, four weeks. Uh, when you remove the plants, like that's usually when they'll they'll go ahead and clean them. They're not usually going to be cleaning them like while the plants are actually in the system. Um, and it's definitely uh, cleaning should probably be more of a constant practice rather than something that people are doing um, here at, like at specific in intervals. Like uh, some of the farms we visited, they they don't have like a speck of dust, like speck of water, or anything on the on the ground and. Um, you know, they're able to use, you know, essentially like no pesticides and, you know, by just using extremely rigorous uh, cleanliness policies. Uh, we, uh, uh, some of the facilities we go into, we, we're literally put in like kind of like jumpsuits and Crocs and we're uh, spraying alcohol in the bottom of our feet and we have these little pads as we go into each room um, and they don't need to use any pesticides. Other facilities we visited, uh, they're basically, they are open to the public. They let people in. Uh, there are, are rooms that have, they say don't go in here. We just like sprayed pesticides in here, like you know it's going to be a nightmare. So it really it really runs the gamut, uh, you know, of different cleanliness practices. Although definitely the the farms that are doing it the best, uh, for the most part, are doing it with rigorous cleanliness standards. Um, and, and that's one of the things that uh, automation would be really good, like automate certain tasks like nutrient dosing so that people can spend more time on cleaning to ensure that, you know, they don't have an entire room, uh, you know, get, you know, spider mites or something and then it costs them millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And then just to like add to that, um, another reason for automation is so that you don't have to be constantly going in and out of the rooms and changing things all the time. Uh, like humans are one of the greatest sources of um, contamination of the, of the system. So by having less traffic, touching the plants less, uh, you're going to have less chances of having these problems. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, hey, I also live in New York City, and I built a uh, hydroponic system in my apartment, so I have limited space. <laughs> cool. So it's wall-mounted, but it actually includes three different types of systems, NFT, and then flow, and deep water. And I'm just wondering, in your travels, if you've seen anybody else kind of mixing hybrid hydroponic systems together? Huh. I actually really curious what yours looks like, but uh, I yeah we haven't I don't know I can't think of anyone yeah. off the top of my head that's mixed the, with you. W the one farm in California that we visited, they had one room that was like a deep water culture room, and then they had eight rooms that were uh, the the dripper systems, and but they actually just recently uh, shut down the deep water culture room. Commercially speaking. Uh, they like it to be uniform, just have a standard operating procedure and have it kind of more like a manufacturing process. And then you'll see 
uh, hobbyists and, and people who are doing it on smaller scales, they might be playing around more, um, or, or even farmers who are maybe like not quite getting started but are planning to get started, they might be kind of experimenting, seeing uh, what system they can handle the, the best. Are you yeah. saying did we see any small? Yeah, yeah it, it's definitely um, kind of uh, consolidating the markets uh, in general. We also visited um, an outdoor grower in Washington, uh, and he grows 35,000 pounds a year, which is essentially unheard of uh, for indoor growers. They're like, uh, if they hit 5,000 pounds, that would be insane. Uh, usually, you know, maybe they're around one or 2,000. Um, and I mean, this like outdoor is he's the low cost producer in the state. He can blow it out. He can sell. He sells eighths for twenty five dollars to the dispensary. You can have it out the door for seventy five. Um, the, the there is definitely though kind of a, a space for the the indoor um, kind of growing with hydroponics because you're able to. Uh, play more with the chemical profiles in the plants and you're able to get kind of this higher quality. So you'll, you'll probably see the lower end of the market get pretty much completely consolidated, especially once you have a federal legalization. There's no way you're going to be able to really compete with, um, you know, John Deere tractors in massive fields. Um, but, you know, we will probably see, um, you know, and this is kind of, this is really more opinion or sort of like kind of in the ether, but you'll probably see something kind of like the model of like the craft brewery, like kind of with beer, like you have like your craft breweries, um, you know, kind of focused on quality and like, you know, no pesticides and this and that. And then, you know, the outdoor, you'll have your Budweiser's as well. Uh, the outdoor grower? Uh, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, they have um, they 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 have a permitting system based on square footage. So they they have permits of thirty thousand square feet that they multiplied. Uh, like a, they had like a hundred permits. Or well, they had room for a hundred permits. Right. But they, they maybe had like eight to ten permits that they were growing thirty five thousand pounds under. Um, and these, like the, the regulations in Washington made it extremely inefficient for them actually to do the farming because they had each 30,000 square foot plot separately staked out and so they could and they had fencing around each one of those. Um, so it, you can really the economies of scale as the, the regulations uh, may change uh, could really uh, change the landscape of the, the lower end. Yes. Can you, uh, is there a possibility Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, typically you want to use something called like a, a carbon filter, which is just like a fan that's going to be sucking up all the air and making sure that it takes out all the different uh, things that smell uh, from the cannabis plants. So in, in, if you want to have like a commercial facility somewhere, then you definitely need to have that because you don't want to be blowing out uh, all that scent. And, and if you're growing like in your house, if you have like, you know, some sort of a grow tent, you can set up like a, a small carbon filter so you can take care of that. Uh, pretty often states have regulations and say like once you're outside of the facility like you know you should not you know be able to to smell it um that's not necessarily true for probably most of the facilities we visited like when you're outside you know where, where you're going uh, <laughs> so yeah yes Yeah, so security is, um, you know, definitely a, a major part of these facilities, mostly on the regulation side. The regulations are often very stringent um, and explicit on what sort of security is necessary. Uh, I think most of the time what we've seen is that there's a camera everywhere. There's, like, you, except the bathroom. Uh, but basically, uh, anywhere you go in many of these facilities, uh, there's a camera on you, and the state has a direct link into each and every one of those cameras. So there could be someone watching you. 
uh, in the you know tending to plants, trimming, drying rooms, everything. There are cameras everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. Um, and uh, California is in implementing you know new regulations that have much stricter security um, uh, concerns. And even the outdoor, there was uh, a camera on every corner at least of these plots. Again, someone's watching over your shoulder every step. Government really wants their tax money. What about things you can't see with a camera? What about digital security? As, as things become automated, like I've seen grow operations with auto-elevated cables and you know, uh, beds that shift to, to move water around to keep the, the level or keep everything clean. And, right? There's a lot, and then you look to the left, you know, and, and uh, there's a massive uh, sets of PLCs that are connected to a bunch of other bullshit somewhere else. Like, that part is one of the things that I'm curious about. How, how are they thinking about those systems? Um, and say, does, does the state necessarily need access to that as well? Because like, that's, that's a whole, like you could ruin somebody's entire crop by you know, shifting lights a little bit. Yeah. So it, the, the, the state doesn't really, you know, the states don't care if uh, you go out of business generally. So they're, they're really watching the, the people in the facilities. Uh, that's what they, they want to make sure that um, every little gram, I mean, every leaf uh, typically needs to be pretty much accounted for and disposed of um, with, uh, you know, different procedures. And, you know, uh, de again, depending on the state, you, you might be weighing the plant right when you cut it down, weighing uh, the flower that you cut off, weighing the, the trim that you took off and stuff like that. Uh, in terms of the, the technology, uh, the PLCs, the control systems, uh, we haven't heard or seen of any integrations with the, the state really, uh, besides maybe like seed to sale, like tracking. So they might be um, in kind of the inventory management systems, but environmental control systems, they don't care if your plants die. Uh, they just care if uh, you know someone is kind of diverting something to a, a gray or black market. Do, they, do the growers themselves show concern over things like that? Uh, some farms are more technically sophisticated than others, although we haven't seen um, you know too much technical sophistication in in most of the facilities. Any other questions? Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much. Thank you.